Um, and I wanted to give this presentation to reflect a bit on um, the system that runs our hackerspace, that runs the soft part of our hackerspace, that runs our community. Uh, and so it's a talk about leaderless communities. It's an introduction to the Hackerspace Blueprint, and the Hackerspace Blueprint is a document that describes how our community works, and it's meant to also be some kind of blueprint for other people who want to do leaderless communities. So, my name is uh, Merlijn Seebrechts. Um, I am currently uh, part of the Ubuntu Community Council for a period of two years. Um, I was until January, I think, or February, I was the board member of this hackerspace. I was one of the board members of this hackerspace for um, eight years, I think, a little bit more than eight years. Um, and I wrote the hackerspace blueprint, although I have to uh, give the caveat that I did not create the content inside of the hackerspace blueprint. I did not create the system on my own. Um, we, we created the system as a collaborative effort uh, during the past eight years, uh, uh, we collaboratively built the system that I will explain today. Um, during my day job, I'm a researcher at IMAC and uh, I teach at uh, Ghent University, but this is completely different from uh, what uh, my area of research is. So, the Hackerspace Blueprint. This is the most important slide of this presentation because you should go to that URL, hackerspace.design, to go download the blueprint and read the blueprint. Um, I think it's an incredibly useful document that gives you some pointers as to how to run leaderless communities, how to do conflict resolution in leaderless communities, and a bunch of other very interesting stuff. Uh, and so the first question is, why do we have this system? A bit of the history. Um, Hackerspace Ghent used to be a system that uh, ran on be excellent to each other. That was like the main rule was be excellent to each other and decide everything by consensus. But this did not work at all. And in 2014, our hackerspace almost imploded. Um, uh, there, there were a lot of things that showed that the hackerspace was slowly imploding. One of the things were meetings about general issues, like a clean desk policy. Even though there was only one person in the hackerspace who did not keep a clean desk, but for some reason the community thought that having a meeting with everybody there talking about how this hackerspace would really like a clean desk, um, uh, for some people, people thought that that would solve the problem with this one member who was not having a clean desk. So obviously, this kind of approach, it doesn't work. Um, we also had group meetings, group meetings with like 10 or 20 people to discuss interpersonal conflict between maybe two or three members. And so obviously, these meetings resulted in a shouting match and uh, uh, they were very uh, aggressive meetings and they did not solve the problem at all. Um, they even made the problem worse because now everybody had an opinion about this interpersonal conflict and everybody had a side. Um, and so there, there were plans to fork the space. But then once people started to actually talk about, okay, what does a fork of the space mean? What does it mean to split up the space and go to a new location and keep the space on the first location. It actually meant that in the original hackerspace, there would only be one person left. And in the new hackerspace, everybody else would go. And so I think if your community is at, at that point, there's two things you need to do. First of all, figure out who this one person is that is having giving so much conflict. And second of all, figure out why the fuck you are in a space in 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 a space like that? Why you are uh, uh, um, in this situation, and why the system hasn't been able to resolve issues with one person? So, um, as a last last ditch effort to save the hackerspace, we decided to hack the hackerspace. Use hacking methodology, hacker culture, in order to look at how can we actually fix the system of our hackerspace, how can we fix our community. Um, in the email that uh, invited people to join this hackerspace, uh, uh, one of the original founders of the hackerspace said that the hackerspace has evolved in the wrong direction. We want to hack this evolution to make it go right again because stuff needs fixing. Uh, 
and then over um, I think yeah it's, it's it's about 10 years over a, a little bit less than 10 years we've had frequent hack the hacker space workshops every single time when something big went wrong in order to figure out how can we improve this system and so the system that I'm talking about today is the result of this uh, effort uh, the first thing that we did in those workshops was figure out why this actually failed. Why can't you just run a community on be excellent to each other? Um, and the first issue is that we expected people to have common sense, but common sense is not common. And you can interpret that in two ways. You can interpret that in some people don't have common sense, and that's a very uh, uh, correct interpretation, but the bigger in the, 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 the bigger point that we figured out is that people have different opinions of what common sense is, but they don't really realize that. They think that people who have common sense all agree on what, what, what common sense things means. But that's not the case. Uh, there is a lot of different opinions on what common sense is. We also expected everybody in the hackerspace to have a single unified opinion. So we could decide things by consensus, 100%. Nobody would disagree every single decision. Everybody would agree on that decision. Um, however, the issue is that people have conflicting goals. People have conflicting views on how the world works. So you will never be able to get 100% consensus. And then the last issue is that we wanted to make perfect decisions. And that goes back to this idea of we need consensus. We wanted to make perfect uh, decisions because a hackerspace that makes perfect decisions at every crossroad will be a perfect hackerspace. Um, however, a lot of issues can't wait until you find a perfect decision. A lot of issues can't wait until you have a three month long discussion process in order to figure out how to solve conflict between two people. Um, so basically, we allowed conflict to fester because of this. Um, for months and months and months, we allowed conflict to fester and everybody hoped that the conflict would just go away on its own, but it didn't go away on its own. So we solved it by hacking our hackerspace and then creating a system. And the system is comprised of three main parts. The general system that our hackerspace runs on now is duocracy. Duocracy basically means that people who do a task get to decide how that task is done. So you don't have meetings to decide how to move forward. You simply have people who are moving forward. And those people, while they are moving forward, they decide how to move forward. The second thing is that um, we still have meetings. However, meetings are mainly to get feedback. You're like, hey, I am organizing New Line. What do you guys think of the program? How do you guys think we can have a, a better reach out to get more people to come to New Line? Um, and then the meetings are also to make financial decisions. Because financial decisions are not something that you can just do on your own and revert them whenever some problem happens. Financial decisions are something that you need a general agreement in a meeting in order to make a financial de uh, uh, decision. However, the meetings are run on a slipping consensus model. So that if an issue has not been decided yet on a meeting, after three meetings, a decision has to be made. We, have, we end up in a certain point system where everybody votes in a very opaque system where it's very hard to know beforehand which solution will win the vote. But after three weeks, we have a solution. Um, in the first week, we try to decide everything by consensus. In the second week, we do it with a rough consensus. Uh, only 20% of people are allowed to uh, veto it. If more than 20% of people are allowed to veto it, then it doesn't happen. And then in the third week, we make a decision regardless. Um, finally, we also uh, created the board as the wardens and counselors of the hackerspace. Um, Part of it is because we need people to have the end responsibility for solving interpersonal conflict. Because we found out that uh, maybe it's something specifically to Belgians, but I think it might be uh, something specifically to 
just people in general, that people just like to put their hand and head in the sand and wait for conflict to solve itself. And conflict almost never solves itself. Conflict has to be actively solved. So if nobody else in the hackerspace is solving a certain conflict, then it's up to the board to actually push through it and uh, solve it. The second thing is that they have end responsibility for core infrastructure and finances. Because the hackerspace needs to run, some things need to keep happening. We need to um, fill in our taxes. We need to uh, pay our uh, uh, rent and stuff like that. Those are things that we can't just uh, um, hope that they happen. And if they don't happen, well, doesn't matter because it matters. If rent isn't paid, uh, we get kicked out. So that's very important. The board has the end responsibility for that. But what you see, what's not on here in the responsibilities of the board is anything that has to do with actual leadership. The board doesn't really decide anything apart from making sure that stuff gets paid. Um, the only thing the board can do as like a, 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 a measure that they can take is basically tell someone um, there is interpersonal conflict between you and another member. You have to leave the hacker space for a certain period of time until we solve this interpersonal conflict. That's like the only hard power uh, that the board has. So a little bit more information about duocracy. The idea of duocracy is that you get authority by doing. In a democracy, you get authority by receiving a vote. In a duocracy, you get authority simply by doing something. Um, and it solves, the, it solves the problem that people have conflicting goals. Because it doesn't matter if somebody else wants something else to happen. If they don't do it, then it won't happen. If you're the person who does something, then you can 100% decide how it happens. Um, an example is the food on new line. Each year, uh, uh, people make food on new line. And each year, there, there, uh, before we had the system, each year there were discussions about, oh, we don't have meat options, even though I really like meat, I don't like food unless there's dead animals in it. Well, it doesn't matter. If you're not the person that is making the food, then you're not the person who is deciding what you will eat. Um, and if you want to meet option, then just make it yourselves. For some reason, every single new line, the people who are cooking are the people who are uh, vegetarians. And so almost every single new line, we, all, we only have vegetarian options. Um, so duocracy, if you do a task, you decide how it should be done. Uh, and one very important thing to note here, and this is something that we have to keep the re reminding the hackerspace of, is that you don't need the opinion of everyone who is affected by your actions. This is very, very different from how we run normal organizations. Ge in general, the organization is that you need input from everybody who is affected by your actions, and then you have to change your action. But this is not the case in a duocracy. And this is specifically so that um, people can get full ownership of what they're doing. Because what we see is that if somebody wants to cook food on online, for example, and we do a meeting about what the sh food should be, and then we make a decision about what the food should be, then probably the person making the food will be less passionate about this kind of um, 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 compromise of food options that they have to make, instead of if they can just fully decide themselves what they have to make. Um, in software, we have this idea of ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Um, but that means that um, decisions need to be revertible. You ask for forgiveness instead of for permission, but decisions need to be revertible so that you can ask for forgiveness if something really goes wrong. But revertible, this, this, this can mean something very broad. For example, if you want to paint the hackerspace, the walls in a certain color, no problem, just do it. Because we can always paint it in another color if in the end it ends up that the whole hackerspace doesn't like uh, that color. Um, the idea is that you, you have to be the change you want to see in the space. Ideas are very cheap. 
we have more than enough ideas about what we should do. Um, we need people to actually implement them. Um, and in every community, there are a whole bunch of people who mostly contribute ideas and think that they are actually contributing to the community. But instead, they are actually reducing the passion of the people who are actually doing things. Um, duocracy means that there is authority. It is not an organization without authority, but you only have authority about the decisions that you make, about the things that you do. And if you stop doing them, then you stop having authority. For example, we have a system uh, with badges in order to get into the hackerspace. Um, we have a bar system, a piece of software that uh, tallies uh, how much uh, you, 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 you drunk, how much you... How much you spent? How much you spent? Um, and uh, and uh, at a certain point, somebody built a whole new system. That certain person, at a certain point, didn't have a lot of energy anymore. They stopped maintaining it. Uh, at that point, they lost authority over the bar system, and somebody else came in and built a new bar system. The moment when you stop doing things is the moment when other people are free to take over and make their own decisions. Um, then another problem is that common sense is not common. One of the ways that we try to solve this is by having a guidelines document. Now, it's very important that guidelines are not a law book. They are a cookbook. It's basically, it shows you what kind of organization we want to live in. It shows you like an ideal space member. But if people are holding up the guidelines and are saying like, oh, according to the guidelines, what I'm doing right now is allowed, then you have a problem. Then that person is a problem. Because you don't have to, um, uh, if you're searching for loopholes or if you're, if you're using the guidelines in order to justify your own actions to people who don't like those actions, uh, then it means that you're actually putting your, your own interest before the interests of the hackerspace and you're trying to use the guidelines in order to uh, have some sort of authority for putting your own interests before the interests of the hackerspace. But that's, that, 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 that's a red flag. That shouldn't happen. So if you see people think like, um, uh, uh, for example, uh, we have this rule that on Thursdays we have social evenings and you shouldn't use a table saw because that's not compatible with a social evening. And if somebody comes and asks, yeah, but what if I'm the only person in the hacker space? Am I able to use the uh, table saw then? And of, of course, like, of course, it's just like, like guidelines, like this is how we want you to, to act in a general sense. These are not the rules that you have to follow. Same thing that somebody says like, oh, I'm allowed to use a table saw because it's not a social evening. So let's say that on a Tuesday, people are playing board games. Somebody comes in and starts using the table saw. And then the people playing board games are like, hey, um, these two activities are not compatible with each other. And we were here first. So um, can you please stop using the table saw? And then this person says, oh, yeah, but you look, look, the, the guidelines say that I can use the table saw today. There's also a red flag. This person has to be, um, this person's behavior has to be addressed. Um, one of the problems is that some stuff still needs to happen. We need to pay the bills, um, even if nobody wants to pay the bills. Um, and that's where the board comes in. The board are the end responsible for both the infrastructure and the culture or the interpersonal um, happenings of uh, our community. Uh, important here is responsibility. They don't have to do this all themselves. But if nobody else does it, it's a responsibility of the board to make sure that it happens. Make sure bills get paid. Make sure that people keep giving presentations about how our community works, teaching new people who come into our community how the community works. Um, and so they have two roles. Warden, which is ensuring that we have the core infrastructure here in which everything can happen. And that's very bare bones. Like we, we need a building. We need internet. We need electricity, um, and that's about it. Everything else is 
optional and everything else can definitely be handled by members and if members don't handle it then it doesn't really matter that much like if we go a few weeks without drinks in the fridge it doesn't really matter people will keep coming to the hackerspace and if they really want drinks they will bring their own <laughs> drinks or go to the shop themselves for drinks um, it's a they're the last resort basically so they are responsible for finance, electricity, housing, safety, and social. Safety is an important factor here also. This includes um, um, physical and mental safety. It's also important that this hacker space keeps being a safe space for um, um, people of all walks of life. And it's important that the board make sure that it stays a safe space. Having a, a safe and accepting culture is core infrastructure. Uh, crisis management and core infrastructure. So, uh, last thing is how to do better meetings. Um, problem is issues don't get solved. Um, the first solution is that in a meeting we decide everything by provided nobody says no. We don't want people to explicitly say yes at a meeting. We want to have a little bit of peer pressure so that if you want to really block a decision, you have to speak up and you have to say, I am the person who is blocking this decision be because of these reasons. This creates peer pressure, but peer pressure is very good. It is a, a natural instinct that we have in order to make sure that our communities stay together, even though everybody has a slightly different view of the world and everybody has slightly different opinions. Um, then uh, the second solution is a more official system that we have. The first meeting that an issue gets brought up on the meeting, uh, we decide things by consensus. The second meeting, uh, we decide things by rough consensus. So 20% so of people in the second meeting have to put up their hand and say, I am blocking this issue to make sure that an issue does not get, uh, that the decision does not get made. In the third meeting, we have the point system. Thankfully, we have never had to use the point system um, by this uh, point. Uh, the point system is, if you have a booklet of the hackerspace blueprint, the point system is uh, a bit problematic uh, uh, because it's in the middle of the booklet. So people open the booklet and see the point system and they're like, what the fuck kind of bureaucratic bullshit is this? Um, but the point system, we've never had to use it, but it's like a sword that's hanging above the community's head that if we don't make a decision after three meetings, a decision will be made and it's very unclear which decision that will be because it's a very convoluted system in order to count votes. Everybody has multiple votes and things like that. Um, one of the things we want to avoid is the bike shed effect. Um, Parkinson's law of triviality. Um, organizations spend disproportionate time on trivial issues. If you have a new power plant and you have a committee, uh, the board of this power plant, and they decide on building a new power plant, uh, it's a budget of uh, $28 million. The discussion about it happens in two and a half minutes. Uh, but, but next to this power plant, we will create a new bike shed or next to the main office, we, we will create a new bike shed and we spend 45 minutes discussing how to paint this bike shed. Because everybody has an opinion on how to paint a bike shed, not everybody has an opinion on how, how to actually build a nuclear plant. So in meetings, often time gets spent more on trivial things because more people have opinions on these trivial things. And so that's a big reason why we don't want to get op the opinion of everybody because everybody has opinion on trivial things and it just slows everything down. Um, as I said before, we want peer pressure because community requires compromise. And peer pressure is a natural way in order to ensure some level of compromise. Uh, you don't need everybody's opinion, again. Uh, the most efficient meeting is a meeting that you don't have. A lot of people, when they first come into the hacker space and they want to change something, they call a meeting in order to ask, how do we want to change this? Instead, we ask them, just change it. Just change it, and if people come and complain, 
to you about that change and they complain about it so much that they want to see it reverted, then you can have a discussion about what the best solution is. But you don't have to have a discussion beforehand because most of the things you will do, even if people don't like it, they, they, they will not dislike it that much that they will actively ask you to revert it. And so stuff keeps happening this way. Stuff keeps happening if you only have the discussion afterwards, after you do something instead of before it. Um, this reduces the armchair experts, the people who come to every meeting and have a, uh, uh, an opinion about every single thing, but don't actually get their hands dirty. And this re reduces the bike shedding. Uh, so again, the most important slide, uh, I have to admit, I copied this slide. This is not the same slide as in the beginning of uh, the presentation. So these are the most important two slides. Uh, hackerspace.design, go to that URL and uh, uh, so there you can see, there you can download the hackerspace blueprint itself. You can also see uh, a podcast that we did with a bunch of people in the hacker community working on uh, building communities. You can also see a bunch of presentations that I gave and uh, more. Very interesting, one of the presentations <coughs> I gave is on a system to solve interpersonal conflict in leaderless communities. I can definitely recommend to also watch that presentation um, uh, because it's an issue that is very common in these kind of uh, counterculture organizations. So I think I have about 10 minutes for either questions or more guided uh, information. I have more guided information about uh, interpersonal conflict and stuff like that. So depending on what your interest is, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, people keep the ownership of a project while they're working on it, and then when they are not working on it anymore, someone else can take over the project or, or start doing the project itself. Uh, do you have a formal way to define uh, if people are still mm -hmm. uh, handling their project or not? How do you make the decision of how this project is not taking care, uh, taken care anymore? And can we take over by someone else? So in the past, so we don't have a formal system. In the past, this happened a lot when something breaks and people ask this person to fix it. And after a few days or a few weeks, we don't hear anything back from this person and it, it doesn't get fixed. That's probably the point at which you are free to take over. How do you take over a system that requires specific access, like a, a server management or something like that, that need credentials and, and stuff like that? Um, you flash it. <laughs> you put a new system on it, you, you buy a new system, you build a new system. Um, we also have this uh, uh, very lax way of handling passwords in this hackerspace. A lot of our passwords are default passwords, so you can also try a bunch of our default passwords and see if that works. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's as ha have as less structure as possible. Um, and we have a really tiny bit of structure in this hackerspace to make sure that it keeps on functioning uh, uh, as a healthy community. But otherwise, we don't want to add processes to maintain passwords or uh, uh, have passwords somewhere else. This morning, I was called up by Bertrand to ask me what is the password for our YouTube account. Um, yeah, because that's, that's, it, it's, it's good enough. It's more than good enough. Um, there was a whole thing about uh, I mean, the democracy doing something gives you the power over the thing you're doing, uh, but how do you come to a consensus in the group that that is the way to do things? Because everybody needs to agree that the one doing this stuff has the power to do whatever they want. Uh, but you need a consensus in that somewhere. Yeah. Um, we have um, at, at about eight, eight years ago, um, we did a big general assembly with everybody who was still interested in running the hackerspace. And we gave the hackerspace the decision, um, do you want to implement this system? Um, 
part of it is that uh, the system already had a bunch of people backing it because all the people who were passionate about the hackerspace were part of creating the system. Um, but on that meeting, we decided from now on, we will use this system. And then when things happen, when people are in disagreement about whether or not parts of the system are good, when people are in disagreement about how we should interpret certain parts of the system, we do another Hack the Hackerspace workshop. And at that point, the people who come to the workshop are the people who decide on how to continue with the system, on how to interpret the system. Um, and then afterwards, for some reason, everybody who wasn't present at the Hacker the Hacker space, for some reason is like, okay, yeah, um, they went to that workshop, they had the mandate in order to change it. Um, so we will follow these new changes. So in general, we didn't really have any issue over the eight years of people challenging whether or not we should continue using this system. Most of it was people challenging like certain parts of people seeing certain issues. And then we do a Hack the Hackerspace workshop to solve this as a community. And then we adopt the new changes. small thing. Uh, there was a certain uh, mention of the responsibilities of the boards and one of them is uh, culture or protection culture. I don't, I don't know how it was. What does that mean? That's a very good question. Um, the idea of culture is in order to solve this issue. Um, having laws and having a legal system in order to enforce laws is very complicated. And so organizations that run on laws um, lose a lot of energy simply creating and maintaining and enforcing these laws. Um, take the current legal system of your country as an example of this. So um, if you go to companies and if you ask, like if, if you do an MBA, for example, or if, if you go to a CEO of a very successful company and you ask them, like, how do you make sure that the employees of this company actually do things that better the company instead of better themselves? Then creating laws of cre or creating rules is only a very, very small part of what they actually use in companies in order to make sure that the employees uh, 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 do everything for the common good and common in, in this sense is the company. Um, things are things like um, um, what motivates people to do good are things like uh, having the, the idea that they are uh, competent, getting autonomy, having relatedness to the, 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 the mission of the company, having purpose, meaning, rewards uh, and Power is only a very, very small part of how you can actually enforce decisions. So basically, this is what we mean with culture. It's to make sure that people, um, it's to make sure that people see the hackerspace as a resource that they need to protect and help grow. If there are people in the hackerspace that see the hackerspace as a resource that they take from, that's an issue. That's something that the board needs to address. The board needs to make sure that everybody is on the same page of this is a common good, this is a common resource that we need to grow, even if me helping grow that resource makes it so that I get a little bit less out of it. So, any other questions? Uh, I can say something. I don't know if it's a question. Sure. sure. Uh, okay. It's inspirational because uh, uh, when I was in my office, we were with a small team in a remote place. So, some days, more days, it feels like you are paid to go to our space all day. And now we are diluted and we have to go back to the like normal world with rules and it's hard to comprehend. Having this on paper and like the whole thing that makes sense, it makes me easier to get in your comment and say, no, it'll be able to do that. But, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure I'm entirely following. Um, so are you talking about like during COVID that 
the the connectedness fell apart or uh, uh, under the fall of the rule of COVID we so we went still to the office, we cooked there everyone, we had meetings and like tiny illegal parties. But uh, it's I think it's after that fell apart. Like, uh, when the, the soccer are uh, wanted to come back and to be present doing nothing, and is the culture that has gone? So, so the, the culture, culture is gone. gone because some people left uh, and then only later came back after, like. Yeah, and other, uh, the, like the baker type left and, uh, and uh, come, maybe, uh, coming back are uh, like Monday to come back. Just, Sitting on chair, they don't have any initiatives. So yeah, so yeah. You, yeah. I think you, you need to fight for this culture. Yeah, yeah. So one one of the things is that you you talk about people just being there and not doing anything. In a company, this might be an issue, but in an organization like the hackerspace, in a sense, this is not an issue, as long as these people don't take anything away from the hackerspace. In the past, these kind of people used to be a strain on our community because these people were in a meeting and then having a lot of opinions, even though they didn't do anything. Um, but when these people just are there and are just talking to other people and don't add any negativity or don't uh, uh, keep other people from doing things, then it's not such an issue. However, the, 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 the thing that you talked about where people left and then afterwards came back and they're not really part of the community. This is something that we were struggling also with uh, after COVID. Even right now, um, I think the, the culture of our hackerspace is still not 100% what it was before COVID. Um, but we are slowly rebuilding it by doing meetings like this. Um, I, I actually think that the fact that we were suddenly going to be kicked out, out out of this place and then go into a new place, I think that also gave everybody like a common goal to rally around to rebuild the culture that uh, we had. All right, it's it's two o'clock exact exactly. So I think that's the the end of the presentation. Thank you.